Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, so, yes, yeah, so uh, we'll talk briefly about uh, kind of open peristomal hernia repair and uh, kind of some additions from this standpoint. Um, I have no other uh, financial uh, relations or disclosures for the next couple of seconds. Um, so, um, as previously talked about, kind of the incidence um, and etiology of peristomal hernias, there are a lot of them out there. Um, this is a paper written by uh, Dr. Gavin Gunter-Ranke from uh, my institution that looked at the nation and wide patient sample from 1998 to 2011. Found a total of 700 or 73,000 peristomal hernias that were performed in that time period, with an increasing number of these repairs happening on a yearly basis. So, kind of learning how to manage these appropriately is a very relevant topic for surgeons in the room and people in practice. As we talked about, kind of on the side here, um, even though this is older data, there the hernia incidence is up there and it does increase in size. Um, obviously, the ones that are end are usually the ones that stay the longest, especially like the um, end colostomy and end ileostomy are higher up in the percentage for incidence. Um, just briefly talking about risk factors, um, you know, I think most of us know these ones already, but advanced age, wound infections, uh, chronic or recurrent high intra-abdominal pressure, uh, usually step with people who are smoking or overweight, uh, COPD, obesity, uh, loss of abdominal wall strength uh, from um, um, inability to kind of walk or someone who's bed bound, uh, and then the kind of the normal ones that you would expect, malignancy, steroid usage, and vice versa. Um, so what are the indications for surgical repair? Um, for me, it kind of these are the ones I would kind of consider right here. Anything um, previously presented, obviously, but development of acute peristomal hernia complications. Um, those include small bowel obstruction and strangulated peristomals, um, and then also chronic symptoms that impair the patient's quality of life, and then all the, everything else that was previously discussed. So what are indications for open repair since I got uh, tasked with doing the open component? These are kind of obviously relative uh, indications, but the ones I kind of consider when I'm considering these repairs. I say large defects. Some people say 8 centimeters. Some people say 12 centimeters are not amendable to minimally invasive surgery. I think anyone can be considered. Uh, but those with large defects, um, those with concomitant incisional hernias, as uh, the previous case also showed. Uh, people with previous repairs, um, or, or this can be a redo, I would consider an open approach. Um, concern for extensive inter or inter abdominal adhesions or extensive abdominal wall scarring. I think if you know you need to go in and do some lysis of adhesions, that can be exceedingly difficult um, on the robot or laparoscopically, especially if you need to take care of all the adhesions. Um, and then I put here on the very end, emergencies. Um, but I think there are exceptions. I think you know, some people can be done minimally invasive, but those um, that have perforation or something like that should be considered an open approach. So what are your options when it comes to doing open hernia uh, repair here? So I, I think there's five different categories when you say you have primary repair, um, you have an onlay mesh repair depending on the type or the technique, and then you have two types of kind of intra-abdominal ones, either extra peritoneal or intra-abdominal. Um, mainly you'd see laparoscopically with this one. And then finally the last one is relocation of the stoma. I will say I think there are cases uh, for every single one of these uh, that is an option. I think um, as we'll talk about the primary repair has extensive amount of um, or high rate of reoccurrence, but there still are indications of when you would want to do that. <coughs> so when it comes to primary repair, and this is mainly focusing on suture repair, uh, the European Hernia Society uh, has a kind of guidelines on this, on the prevention and treatment of peristomal hernias. Um, when, and, their, and their phrasing here, I think, is the important part when you look at it. So when it comes to primary suture repair, they say there's an unacceptably high risk of reoccurrence in the elective setting. So I think when you have someone you're considering doing an elective setting, they always say strongly recommend against not doing that. Um, I think that, as I said at the bottom, it can be reserved for specific situations or it can be reserved for emergencies. Uh, <coughs> sorry. Um, this is another kind of review. This is a surgical techniques of peristoma hernia and a systematic review, just kind of just, do you do mesh, do you not do mesh? And I think that's what that initial thing was saying, that the high recurrence rate. When you look at this, they looked at 30 studies here, um, and they are, and they were included this in the review article. Mainly this was retrospective, so it was not prospective at all. But they, they saw a significant increase in recurrence rate when people were primarily repaired without mesh, uh, with an odd ratio of 8.9. Um, from that standpoint, let's just say, mesh-based repairs definitely have the longevity of the repairs you're looking for when you're doing these in a hopefully permanent fashion. Um, so what if we talk about onlay? So two types of onlay. You can do onlay synthetic, and then we'll talk about onlay biologic. This is a very small case study here, um, but a peristomal hernia repair with onlay mesh can be sec uh, um, safe and effective. It can be done two different ways. You can make the incision from the midline and tunnel over to the peristomal hernia, or you can make it at the hernia or even lateral. Um, you do a nice subcutaneous dissection across the anterior rectus and into the oblique fascia so you can have adequate landing zone for your mesh. Um, the hernia can then be reduced and you can either do kind of a keyhole circle approach um, and you can lay that right on there and fix it to the anterior fascia. 
This does come with a high risk of seromas, uh, obviously superficial wound infections, just like raising flaps and hernia repair, you do run that risk, especially if you're tunneling way over uh, and way laterally, you will run that risk of that um, happening. Now, can you do this in a biologic fashion? Of course, and there are reasons and scenarios why you would need to do that. Um, as this study they looked at here, they looked at uh, 30 patients over 34 months who underwent parasomal hernia repair with biologic mesh. Uh, the vast majority were colostomies. Um, 26 out of 30 of them were primary hernias. They did have one perioperative death, but 29 people made it to the follow-up. Um, and what they kind of came from this is that 26 of these people developed recurrent peristomal hernias with the biologic mesh on late repair. Uh, so their clear recommendations from this one is biologic mesh has poor long-term outcomes and an unacceptable high reoccurrence rate. Like I said, are there scenarios where you may need to use biologic? Of course, but when we're talking about elective setting, I would refrain from this kind of um, approach. All right, so then when we talk about intra-abdominal and extra-abdominal uh, mesh placement, there's a couple places you can place this. You can do a retrorectus repair, you can do a prepared needle repair, or you can do an intra-paired needle repair. Um, so really three kind of areas that you can land your mesh if you want to. The images on the right here are obviously intra-paired needle. Um, and the techniques kind of you can do is a keyhole versus sugar baker, and then you can do a funnel or top hat, which we'll discuss, which is a little, um, for me, it was a little less known. I, and I'll show the paper about this one. Um, so this is not an active paper that's published, but the um, surgeons at Cleveland Clinic are going to actually investigate this in a prospective uh, fashion, so this will be something we can update in a couple of years. But they're going to compare sugar baker versus keyhole mesh in an open retromuscular peristomal hernia repair, and this will be a randomized controlled trial. Um, they're hoping to uh, end the target date of enrollment this summer, um, so hopefully we have some information here. They obviously think in their hypothesis that the sugar baker will have reduced peristomal hernia repair. Um, they save 20% at two-year follow-up. So it'll be interesting to see what this paper says when it comes out. Um, and then this is the funnel top hat mesh approach. Um, it took a little while. The pictures are kind of a little difficult, but this is at Malone, or, uh, Sloan Kettering. They used what they call inverted top hat. So initially when they did this, they used xenograft. Um, so they used a synthetic mesh and they sewed a xenograft funnel on top, which you can see in the top left photo, which I think this one right here. Um, and so what they kind of do is they kind of slide it in over. It's inverted, so the mesh lays on the abdominal wall, and then this funnel kind of runs down right here into the abdominal cavity. Um, or even in between, you can do it in between like the rectus and run it down through the peritoneum. Um, they did it initially when they were using the xenograft. Uh, they had pretty high recurrence. They have um, now switched to synthetic uh, component for the funnel. Um, and they sew them back together, and you can see how they kind of tighten this all back up. Um, they've only had two um, recurrences at 22 months after that point in time. It is a small study. I think there are considerations about wrapping the bow in synthetic mesh um, with, from an erosion standpoint, but this is an approach that people are using. They also have uh, documentation in colorectal surgery journal that they do this for in colostomies for LARs, or APRs, right? Um, and this, we already saw this right here. I mean, this is the depressing part about hernia repair, especially peristomal hernia repair. As we said, the primary repair has a 70% recurrence. These are all really smaller journals. The onlay has almost a 20%. So the vast majority of repairs that you're going to do are going to run the risk of coming back. So I think that's very important when it comes to surgical planning to know that you may be back in that admin. You may have to do this again. So, you know, sometimes if it's a small hernia or uh, we'll talk about any things, maybe you don't go for the big repair to start with. Uh, maybe you wait. Um, and, you know, not everyone has to have this surgery. Um, so let's talk about prevention. This is a big kind of highlighter topic that people talk about now. Um, there's European guidelines on this. This uh, paper right here, I believe, was published in the Netherlands. I, uh, you'll have to hold me to it. It was published just a couple months ago. So they looked at uh, 12 randomized control trials. They looked at 581 patients that had mesh and 671 without mesh reinforcement. They found that the incidence of, uh, was a significant reduction in those with mesh repair um, in the uh, prevention and primary standpoint with an odds ratio of 0.6. Now, this is the interesting part is they said the results were not statistically significant when they looked at only the studies over the last five years. Um, but given that, they had no difference in postoperative mortality, morbidity, hospital length to say, or colostomy specific, or specific morbidities. Um, despite this, the authors write in their paper that they believe that there's a significant risk reduction if you do a uh, synthetic uh, mesh in the primary creation of your peristomal hernia. Now, there are multiple ways to do this. You can use staplers. You can use the storm technique. Um, there are multiple ways to do this. This is also coming in the realm of trauma when they talk about doing this in uh, primary laparotomies. Um, so what are the European Hernia Society guidelines? I think this is a really, really, really good job here. So um, they looked at this really strongly and they kind of broke this off of ileostomies and ileoconduits versus colostomies. And their recommendation is when it came to 
uh, in colostomies, they did strongly recommend with high quality evidence, as you hear, is recommended to use a prophylactic synthetic non-absorbable mesh when constructing an elective permanent in colostomy to reduce the risk of parasitic hernia repair. However, they did not extend this to ileostomies or ileoconduits um, in their initial paper. Um, so in summary here, we'll just kind of hit brief points. Um, Peristomal hernias uh, provide a complex surgical problem today. They have increasing incidence on a yearly basis, and there's something that every surgeon is going to have to deal with. Um, I think as we talk about it, as through this entire talk, consideration of the optimal repair is patient-specific. There's no right answer for anybody. There's no right answer or only this way to do this. And I think when you see these many options, there is never the best way. Um, I think that you need to consider on-land primary repairs. Um, in emergency situations or small, easy, reducible hernias, um, the ones that you know that most likely they are going to have this for 60 years, they're going to come back. So you can consider a smaller approach to start with. Um, or patients with significant comorbidities or a, a really extensive surgical history where you say, I, you know what, I don't really want to go in this abdomen. It's a small peristomal hernia. Let's just do an incision. Let's do a primary repair or let's do an on lane mesh and let's prevent, you know, the eight hour case and lysis of adhesions. Um, the sugar baker and the key hall have better outcomes than other repair options, regardless if it's laparoscopically, regardless if it's open. They do have less recurrence rate when you compare them to both the online um, and the uh, primary repair. This does not extend to the funnel repair. The funnel repair is more small set, so I would not include that in this as of right now. Um, I will always say this, considering minimal invasive options in elective settings, I don't think there's anything wrong with putting a scope in anybody to start. I think if you want to start laparoscopically and have to convert to open, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but there are definitely areas where you want to start open, and I think that's in patients with large defects when you anticipate an extensive adhesiolysis that may be different lapar or difficult laparoscopically or on the robot, um, or if it's an urgent or emergent case, if someone has a bowel perforation in their stoma, that will be exceedingly hard to do laparoscopically, and most likely that patient just needs an open repair. I think there's more important on focus and prevention. Um, so I think that this is one that starts considering my personal work. I do not put um, prophylactic um, mesh in my end colostomies if I'm making them. Something I'm going to consider now in the future. Um, and then consideration of stoma relocation um, with repair of the previous hernia site. And there will be a talk on this one, so I'm not going to extend on this. Um, and I think also, I think this will be covered there, is just if the patient hasn't seen a colorectal surgeon, send them the colorectal surgeon. Are they a candidate for reversal? Some people get, you know, colostomies at outside hospitals and they're told they have to have this for life and they're seen by a colorectal surgeon and they're like, no, we can definitely take this down. So you just have to repair the hernia when they take down their ostomy. So I think that that's also a consideration. So don't forget to use your resources you have at your hospital or your institution or a second opinion to see if that colostomy actually is reversible and you don't have to do a peristomal hernia repair. You can just do a, what it comes to is just an incisional hernia where the ostomy site is. So I'm going to believe that's it. That's the last slide. Yeah. Thank you, everyone.